Okay. Okay. I, as I said, I'm I'm Carol Matthews. I've been a Hamilton County Master Gardener. This is my 14th year, and uh, so I have my nice, wonderful gold tin badge. Next year, I get the I get the next one up. Uh, my husband is also a Master Gardener, so we get to share it together, and that's great for a husband and wife team to enjoy the, the plants. We've been gardening for quite a while. Uh, I love to share whatever we've learned and uh, to do. We have a lot of projects. Hamilton County is second only in a, a membership for the state of Tennessee, but we consider ourselves number one for Tennessee. And therefore, uh, you're, we try to give as much education. I'm the education chairman. I'm the past, past, past president and a past uh, leader of the Expo. So this is, uh, we do Hamilton County. We try to spend as much education out as we can to everybody. And we hope that you enjoy our videos that we're putting out right now, instead of being able to see you in person. Presentation is much more interesting and when you can actually interact with the people. And uh, that's part I miss the most is really being able to, to actually work with you. But we'll do the best we can under the circumstances. Um, we'll start with uh, today, which is the hydrangeas. The hydrangea is a, a genus of about 70 to 75 different species. It's a flowering plant. It's native to Southern and Eastern Asia and America. The shrub is, uh, can, be a, it can be a shrub or even a climbing plant. It has rounded or flattened flowery heads of small florets, the outer ones which are typically infertile. Excuse me just a minute. I have to get my cat out. My cat thinks he's, he's a person. But um, anyway, the um, hydrangeas are, like I said, are native to, to Asia and America, uh, would, being the oak leaf would be that one. And by as far as greatest, it comes from Azalea, comes from Asia, China, Japan, and Korea. Uh, actually, they were first discovered. Most of the shrubs will be one to three foot tall. However, some can get a lot taller. My limelight does get up to six feet tall and that one. Uh, and of course they can climb trees, which can go up to, you know, 40, 50, maybe feet even up for that one. Uh, they can be deciduous or evergreen, though mostly that we, that we grow would be deciduous with a hundred different species and varieties. There are uh, characteristics of hydrangea. Uh, uh, Tom, did that advance? Because I'll be sure I've got the right one. Did the slide dance? I think Tom's not there. Okay. Characteristics of the hydrangea. Yes. Yeah, oh, it did. Okay, good. One of the few plants that can accumulate aluminum. And uh, a good example of that is I, I have one that uh, is just about gone because she's about 50 years old. And uh, she uh, was planted outside my porch. We had a problem with some water coming in on our on our porch back there because it's on the ground. So my husband used that aluminum um, metal sheeting that you can buy by the row, and he put it down by the foundation to keep the rain from coming in. And that particular year, I have never seen such a, a blue color. It was just a peacock beautiful blue color of the, of the hydrangea because it's an older uh, heirloom mop head, and it had absorbed so much of that. So it will they will ab absorb the aluminum and uh, it helps to, to in intensify the color. They also produce their main flower clusters from shoots that are formed on the previous season. And that's very important to know when it comes to pruning and so forth, because uh, for the most part, especially all of the old fashioned ones, they do set their blooms in the previous season. If terminal buds are destroyed, then that's when it will fail to bloom. So if you prune at the wrong time or we get a bad freeze, We've had a you know a real warm winter as such, and then we get a bad freeze right before spring, uh, and those terminal buds are killed. Then that will cause your your plants not to bloom. Uh, they're widely used as dried flowers. A lot of uh, dried flowers are, are, are hydrangeas. The blue are the ones that holds their color the most. They they are by far the most color intensive to hold their color. Some of the newer uh, reds and so forth now. Will hold their will hold their color, as as far as that part is concerned. The uh, uh, 
Japanese first called them the mountain hydrangeas because that's where they were first discovered in the mountains of Japan. The hydrangeas are smaller in statue and have similar leaves and delicate lace cap flowers for theirs. The uh, most hydrangeas bloom once in the summer and fall and that has been the norm for a very, very long time. But because it is so uh, valued as a bush and so many people love it, they've been really working with it, all the hybridizers and so forth. And now we do have a whole line of rebloomers. So now you can buy them so they will bloom more than once in the year. The rebloomers set their blooms in the spring and the fall. And so therefore, uh, if, if you do you did, the pruning and so forth doesn't harm them as much because uh, they bloom, uh, they set their buds on both the new and the old wood. The types of uh, hydrangeas that we have are the mop head, which is the one that we're the most familiar with. And that's this one over here. And this is the one that really changes a lot of color according to the pH in the soil. This is the one that you can do so much change. This is the one you grew up with. This is grandma's plant. And this is, you know, well, I say this is my 50 year old plant that I've got on that one. And um, she's been a very good, very good plant, but she's just, just about gone through the years. I've, I've got her repotted right now to see if we can get any more uh, out of her, but uh, they do last a long time. And um, then we have the pinnacle shaped ones. This is we're most familiar with, with our oak leaf hydrangeas. That's the one that you'll be the most familiar with, even though there's a smaller one called PG and up, up, up north they refer to all of them as Grandiflora, but there is a difference. Then we have the climbing hydrangea. Now this one you might not be as familiar with. Uh, I wasn't for a, a, quite a while. And we have a master gardener and her and her husband uh, both, um, our master gardeners and their garden was on tour a few years ago and there was this big beautiful tree in the yard and it was blooming all up and down the trunk and everybody was having a fit what vine and so forth is this but it was actually a climbing hydrangea and we'll talk about that a little bit later about how, how wonderful they are it's the only one of the hydrangea family that does have a slight scent on that one and the other one is the lace cap and that is actually what it looks like. The, uh, the little blooms in the middle, it, they never come out. It's just around the edges that they come out. And that's a flattened cluster of tiny little immature uh, round buds that, uh, and the edges have about four to five petal flowers all, it was all out on the, on the outside. The reblooming series uh, that you might be interested in would be Endless Summer, and that was the first one that was that was uh, cultivated for us to have. And then uh, we have Let's Dance Forever and Ever. And now there's one, and I've got a slide later, it's on the city line, which is the little dwarf miniature ones, which actually can be grown in containers uh, that, that Connie just finished talking to you about. But usually uh, what we've always had before has been these nice big bushes. And, and they can go in containers, very large containers for, for those. The choice in your landscape, there's a lot of different uh, places. They do need some sun, preferably morning sun, but they won't shade in the afternoon. They do not have to be in a wet place, but they do need to have moist soil and it needs to drain well for that. So uh, that's one of the considerations where it would go in, in the yard. The uh, zones are very important. Uh, as far as, as growing the different ones. We, um, anything past zone four, which of course is going south, hydrangeas just don't grow down there. It, it just does, it just gets too hot and so forth for them. But we do have some that have gone as far as uh, zone five, which is already up there at New York and Canada. Uh, some of them are, are uh, the oak leaf hydrangea is a native to America. And Annabelle, which I'll show you in a little bit, she is a cultivar off of the wild hydrangea, which is native. So these are obviously much more, have much more stamina and can grow in a wider area. The oak leaf PG and anabolic hydrangeas are easy because they have a wide variety of climates. The, um, we are in 7B, if you're up on the mountain, it's 7A, and that is our zone. So you want to follow that, as Connie said earlier, on their, their they should come with a tag that tells you 
the more appropriate zone for the different ones and um, that they're coming up with. The mop head and the lace are the most easily grown and uh, zone eight is actually where they flourish the better and that's a little bit below us. However, uh, we do get a good, a good growth here. But uh, if you go down closer to Atlanta, I mean, you're really going to see it. And then uh, if you go over towards Birmingham, there is a uh, garden called Hooper uh, in Hooper, Alabama, which is outside of Birmingham. And it's the Aldridge Garden. And that is a hydrangea haven. That is the most beautiful place. There's so many varieties and they are absolutely gorgeous. Plan your trip about the 1st of June, somewhere along in there. And it will just astound you as to how many were there. This is where the snowflake hydrangea was first um, cult made a cultivar there. It was a private home, of course, years ago, as most of our big gardens are nowadays anyway. And uh, this is where the Mr. Aldridge uh, actually made the cultivar was there. And it's, uh, it's in the oak leaf family. The uh, one that you see up here is, um, it is, is, is one of the old fashioned ones. And like I say, this is the one that will, will change a lot with the, with the soil. Uh, this is Marissa, and this is uh, a variegated hydrangea. Now, there's not very many of those. There's just a couple of those, and they do seem to have the more purple blooms on that one. I had one for a little while, and we had a, had a bad season, and it was brand new to me, and it, it didn't make it. And so I, um, I really hated to lose that one. This one down here and the one over here both, this is Lady in Red. And what happens with her is she, her stems are actually even red. And she comes out extremely pale. It almost looks white, you think. It's just a, tint, a hint. But as she goes, as the bloom gets older and older, it goes to this pink, more of this pink, and it actually goes on to a deeper uh, mauve, to, into a mauve to a deeper magenta, not magenta, but um, cranberry type color. It kind of moves along, and it's, it's a lace cap. And again, this is the, the typical old fashioned one at this point in time. The zone factors must be considered for these. Um, the, this year, uh, I mean, uh, years past, we have had um, different kinds of, of spring, of um, early or late winters, as you say, and so forth. So it does change sometimes the, the way that they will bloom. The um, mop heads and the lace caps thrive here very well, and uh, the, if the soil is acid, the blooms are more blue. If the soil is alkaline, then it's more the pink or the red. And of course, the pH does change as it goes along. However, it does not change your whites. Whites never change. The whites are whites, no matter what else happens. It's only the other, other colors that can possibly change. Annabelle is one of the white. And Annabelle is extremely hardy. Annabelle will always bloom. One way or the other, she manages to bloom. And she comes out with this kind of a small little bloom here. It has a kind of lime green, you know, and as, as the bloom gets, gets older and older, it gets larger and larger, and it turns just beautiful white, perfectly white. The reason it can go all the way up to zone 3A, which is Canada. Uh, and part of that reason is because it was uh, cultivated from the uh, wildlife uh, the uh, hydrangea, and therefore it has more stamina, and the um, wild hydrangea has a whole east coast growing area. I've got a map of that to come up later to show you uh, actually what that particular plant is. You can get the wild hydrangea at Reflection Writing <coughs> at, at their, when they have their sales on that one. <coughs> The uh, panic paniculata plants, these are the ones that are the, the cone-shaped ones and so forth. Usually we think of those as being our oak leaf hydrangeas. And they, um, are, uh, again, like I say, they, they are native. It, now the cultivars they've come up with are not, but the actual original uh, oak leaf hydrangea is native to America. They are, uh, all the paniculatas are very cold hardy and they can grow up as far as, as Canada. Most grow equally well in the south except for grandiflora. Now some of us above, north above us call all of the oak leaves grandiflora, but that is not the truth. Only the ones that will grow on up 
and to six and seven zones and so forth can be referred to as grandiflora. Unlike the mop heads, they need several hours of sun. In fact, they, they've got to have sun or they won't even bloom and they do not want wet soil. They do not want wet feet in any way whatsoever. It will, in 24 hours, you can lose a plant in, in the wet with wet feet. They really don't like it. They like it drier and they like more sun for it, for them to grow. They will go almost anywhere uh, in, that you plant them in, in the yard. They will take some shade, but they've got to have uh, more sun. They can't take shade all day as opposed to some of their cousins that can take dappled light and so forth. They've got to have the um, more, more sun. This one over here uh, is, uh, is, is, is starting to be one of the, the new ones. I just recently got that one. It's called strawberry vanilla, and I am so anxious to get that one planted and uh, see how she's going to do. But she actually has comes out with the pink and white blooms as opposed to the white, which eventually will, will turn. Um, they bloom all the way into the fall. And so therefore, uh, and they change, and I'll show you a little bit more about them as we go along. The oak leaf is, uh, like I say, it changes. It starts out as white, beautiful uh, cone-shaped plants and so forth. As the summer moves along, it starts to change its colors. It goes into this, this light, uh, copper-looking color, this type of thing. And then by the time we get to the fall, you can get really bronze and copper blooms. So you've got interest from the oak leaf all summer and into fall. It's called oak leaf hydrangea because the leaves are similar to the oak leaf. It's there. Um, they even like relatively hot summers. And I have found that, that the hotter the summer, the more that will even want to bloom. Now, I, if we get the drought spell like we did last year, then you will need to water. You, you can start to see it limp a little bit and water. However, uh, do not uh, overwater. And that is uh, one of the, and uh, I, I lost one by, by the overing water and on that. Oak leaf can form a single bloom or the double bloom, the snowflake, which is this one uh, right here in the middle. You can see that the blooms are actually layered. It's almost like six layers to the bloom. That's why this one is so different from all the rest of them. This one over here is Gatsby Moon, and the, you see, it's still got the cone shape, but it's a fatter cone, and those little flowerettes are densely in there. They're, they're tightly packed. This is Ruby Slippers. She comes out, and she's, she's just red. That's just it. She just wants to be red, and she stays that way, and it's so forth. This is Strawberry Vanilla, and this is the one that I'm really... Uh, excited about here because it is just, to me, that is just so pretty. It looks like cotton candy or whatever it is. This again is the snowflake bush, but this is one of the, the a blow up of the actual plants. And you can see how, how different it is from all the others. You can get four seasons of color with the oak leaf uh, hydrangeas on that one. They will tolerate um, a lot more, they, they have a lot more tolerant than their, than their cousins are for that matter. The ruby slippers produces the white flowers and then they turn this pink rose, but then they hold their color the rest of the time. It was introduced to us just, just a few, just a year or so ago, actually it's not, very, not here very long, from the National Arboretum and they have a breeding program and it was actually bred in McMinnville, Tennessee. This jewel of a plant combines the upright habit of a snow queen but it's the compact thing of the little PGs. So this is, this is one that you may want to try, to try to find. Here are the little PGs. Now they are, I guess you might say, maybe they're the dwarf oak leaf hydrangeas as such. Their blooms are not as large, they're smaller. Uh, actually limelight is, is part of the ones they consider to be in this family on this one. But now I found out that my limelight gets pretty, pretty good sized blooms on it. But it is one, it's the only one that can be trained into a tree. So if you hear somebody talk about a hydrangea tree, this is the one they're talking about. It's the only one that'll do it, at least not right now. You know, they, they're working with everything all the time. So but right now, this one can go into a, a, a tree form. And their blooms will come out kind of a limish green, they get pretty white, and then they'll go back again. Um, they, they can stay on the bush, and if they stay on the bush through the through the winter, they'll get this uh, kind of a cream 
looking color. The dried plants on there will get a, a cream looking color on there, which is right pretty. The climbing hydrangea. Now that one is uh, very spectacular in what it can become, as you can look over here and see, go up the tree. Uh, I got one a couple of years ago, and I, I didn't realize that it, that it needed to be on a porous surface. So I had it on a, a, a metal uh, climber, and it, it never did anything. And so then I moved it and put it to the base of a tree, and I took its runners, and I put it up on the tree, and I took a rope, and I tied the runners to the tree. Because what makes it climb is that on the hair, and if, if I was in person and I had this, this is where I would show you uh, what this would be. But if you can kind of look in your screen right through there, those, uh, it has aerial roots, which is like little hairs that come out and they grab into the bark or the brick that you've got. That's why it needs to be porous so it can grab into it. And that's how it will climb. And uh, we've recently moved and uh, I'm going to be taking this one with me. And I noticed though the other day that it has finally attached to the tree and it's very happy there. I will try to pull it off and see if I can do some propagation with it uh, for the pollens, but I'm gonna bring it, bring it here because I don't wanna leave it and uh, put it on a tree and let it start all over again. But it, they do climb. Their flowers are a little bit, they're kind of round and puffy, a little bit like the original, um, the um, old fashioned ones, but then they spread out like your lace cap, and they do have a slight uh, fragrance. Basically, they are a vine as such, uh, as, as vines would be called because of the aerial roots. They are good for zones five through seven. Again, we're on the edge of it, but it will do well here. As I can tell you by Shirley's, it was absolutely gorgeous. Uh, they do need, as do all hydrangeas, but especially this one, you want to cover the ground with, um, with a mulch, a, a pretty good mulch, a, an inch or two of mulch, because you do want to keep those roots uh, from getting, uh, the, plant, the main plant roots, you want to keep them cool. I mean, they're, they're going to be climbing up through here, but you do want to keep those uh, to be cool down at the bottom for that one. The um, re Endless Summer is one of the rebloomers. Uh, Broomstuck has been, Broomstruck is the one that seems to be the hardiest that will grow in the most variety of areas. Um, I do have uh, uh, the, the uh, uh, Twist and Shout, um, which is a lace cap one. However, the first year that I got it, because I guess of my soul or whatever it was, it was completely blue. So I had thought I had a little boy. And the next year she layered herself, had a little baby. So then I know, nope, that's, that, was, that was not it. It was supposed to be pink. And uh, they are, they're really pretty. This Summer Crush, got that particular one. And that, that color is deep, deep red. It is just beautiful on that one. And um, then of course there's Blushing Bride, which is the white, and this is the uh, original one here. They were um, good for the South, uh, down to zone four. And of course, like, like I said before, nothing below zone four is gonna be good. The reason that they're so good about reblooming is they set their, they do put their, uh, they set their blooms on the new and the old wood. So they're going to bloom first on the probably on the wood, and then and then the new comes after that. That will bloom for later into the fall. Let's dance is another reblooming one, and it has two lace cap in its family, diva and uh, starlight. The uh, one for this one, I don't have a picture of it, which is the, um, or Moonlight rather, which they consider to be the most winter hardy, but I don't have a picture of that particular one. And I just got a note, my, my internet says unstable, so if you get a little blown, I'm, I'm out in the country and sometimes if the wind's blowing and it is today, so if you might get a little lost. The uh, whole variety of these are the reblooming ones. And uh, the, the new cultivars hold a lot to their original colors. The soil can change them uh, maybe to the, the intensity of the colors or the light of the color, but it doesn't as, as generally change from blue to pink to, to the purple and so forth. It doesn't do as big a change as it does our old fashioned ones. Forever and Ever is another one that's come out. It's not quite as um, big as some of the others, but it can um, 
it can get to like 30 by 30 as opposed to some of the other plants that get a bit larger. The, um, it blooms on, uh, it's more compact uh, it, as far as the, as the bush is concerned. As you can see, it's a little bit more compact with the more blooms. This is my favorite of the one in that one is peppermint and uh, it causes a two-tone and, and I don't have that one and I'm looking to, to get this one and add this to my collection because I think it is so pretty. Uh, there's an, another one and I'll have a slide of it later to show you. Uh, it's called City Line and it's almost a miniature dwarf and, and they're really made for containers uh, for people to sit on patios and this type of thing for that one. Planting. Remember that it is a bush. So you will follow all of your normal guidelines for planting a bush, which means that you will go two to three times the circumference of your pot or your plant for the size of the hole that you're going to dig. Dig it down a little bit deeper than you're gonna actually put the plant so that you can go ahead and backfill because you, you want to loosen up everything around it. Once you get the hole, you want to pour it full of water and then you wanna wait till the water goes completely on down. You want to watch it perk and go on down on into the soil. Then set, get ready to set your plant. Now, when you take your plant out of the pot, it, that's more than likely, especially if it's a large bush, it's been in that pot for a year or more and it's going to be crowded and those roots are gonna be curled and so forth in there. So as with all of your bushes, never take, even, even, those, even small little plants, never take them out completely if they look like the, the ball is really tight and it's just as tight as it can be root gone. You want to tickle those roots, you want to break them out apart. You may even find a whole bunch of them on the bottom that's matted. Go ahead and cut those away. That they're, they're not needed down here, they're just gonna cause a problem. Leave all the good healthy roots up at the top. And be sure that you spread them out a little bit. And uh, I was talking about that to, to somebody at my church last year, and she looked at me kind of strange and she said, you know, I had two hanging baskets and one I dropped and just spilled everywhere. And I had to put it all back in the basket and then I hung it up and she said, that one is doing so good. And I thought I'd probably lost it because I dropped it. And I said, no, what you did was you broke it up, you gave it some air, and then you, you, you know, it reconditioned the plant. And the other one was, was potted in there and it's, it's, it's crowded, it can't breathe. So be sure that you uh, do open up your root system. And then you want to put some of the soil back in there. Um, a good mixture of your, it's going to go in the yard, so therefore it's a good mixture of your garden soil, which can be uh, your regular um, topsoil mixed with, uh, amend, amended with some of the um, liquid, the uh, black gold that we call it and some things like that. Uh, anything that will to go in there, your own compost is the best to use, but mix it in there in the soil. Um, don't be sure that you still use all the soil that's around it. Don't just take all the soil out of the hole and then put all the new soil back in there because while it's in that wonderful growing little area at one point in time, it's got to send its roots outside of that little hole that you dug. So once it hits that wall of clay or something, it's gonna be shocked because it didn't have it. So be sure that you mix your regular soil in with the other soil and blend it all together so that it doesn't get a shock when it gets on out into the yard area. After you fill it about halfway full, then you can put some more water in there uh, to dampen that and then go ahead and top it off with your soil. Leave it um, enough above the ground that when you add your mulch, you won't go too far up on the stem. You don't want to go past its natural area that it's been in the soil. And you can tell by looking at that, you can see where the, where the plant actually comes out of the soil. And that's as high as you want it to be, even with your, with your mulch on that one. And that's when you do the planting. General maintenance uh, is the soil needs to be uh, rich and well-drained with some compost in there for that one. Uh, now, it will, they will grow here. Uh, even though we have the clay base, we just do, we, but do amend it with some that makes it a little bit better. Uh, lots of times for all of my bushes, I like to mix that little fine uh, bark that you can get at Lowe's uh, in there, especially with my ferns or anything else. It just kind of keeps the soil from packing down our normal clay soils to pack. My sister, and she's on here, she's in Virginia, and uh, I mean, you talk about soil. Her soil is, is, is she's out on the peninsula. It's kind of a sandy thing. And uh, so hers is, is uh, so much lighter and easier uh, than what we have to deal 
with here, which is almost sometimes we think it's like concrete. Uh, be sure that you mulch always uh, to protect the roots and protect the plant from drying out, especially in our summer conditions. We want to be sure to do that. Slow soil release uh, is always good as osmocote, which Connie was telling you about, or 10-10-10. I have a tendency to use a lot of 10-10-10. It is just an even balanced fertilizer, and it's especially good for my older plants and things, just to give them a little shot of something they need. That way the plant, if it needs something more for its roots, it can take it, or if it needs more for blooming, it can take it, or whatever it is. Uh, there are specialized um, fertilizers that you can get and Connie just covered some of that in the container planning a while ago. And so those you may want to get, but generally for our bushes and everything, a good 10, 10, 10 is, is good after it's established. Fertilizing in early spring and to late June, but never past July the 1st. Remember, when July comes along, stop your fertilizing in our area, because then you're going to take the risk of burning up your plants. Than, and trying to make the plant put out more than it can put because now we are getting into our dry conditions and the plant does not need to be stressed. So I like to start in late March or, or early March, depending on what our summer is like, I mean, how our winter is like, early spring. By the 1st of April, 1st of May, 1st of June, try to put out some of the 10, 10, 10 on that one for just a general scattering of it. But then July the 1st, stop and don't do it anymore after that. Winter mulch heavily to protect it from the cold, hardwood or leaf mulch, either one, but just be sure that it's on there. If you use leaf mulch, you can actually uh, come fall, you can just rake some of the leaves on up into the bush itself, and it just adds a little extra protection. Pruning. This is the difference between getting blooms and not getting blooms on anything except your rebloomers, which of course will do it on the new wood. On the old-fashioned hydrangeas, the ones that, 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 that we've always known, and the, and the first cultivars that we've got, they bloom once a year. After they finish blooming, that's when you want about, if you wait, you can bloom, I mean, within a couple of weeks. But if you wait like a, over a month or two or whatever it is, and you start to, to cut off where it's already starting to set buds, so, I mean, you may get still get some blooms around the bottom if you haven't pruned down there. But if you've pruned up around the top, you've already removed the little terminal buds that are already starting for next year in that one. So you want to uh, uh, not do not prune, uh, prune in the fall or anything like that uh, for that one. Now for oak leaf hydrangeas, that's just the opposite. You do prune in the fall and late winter. That's when you want to prune for them but not the uh, mop heads or the lace caps on that one. You don't want to do that. And when you do, uh, and, and then you want to prune out all the dead wood. Now come springtime, when they start to put out and you see that you, you wait for a little while, you'll see that you've got a lot of stalks. And I'll pull one off here. Well, I can't pull it off, it's, it's still alive. If you go out there and you take the sticks, and I don't know if I can turn this around a little bit here. I've got too much in the, in the film. You can't see it very well. I've got too much uh, room in here. This one is very pliable, okay? It's, it's still got life in it. Now, if I go over here and I pick up one and it breaks, then I know that's a dead one, but this one is still pliable. This is, this is my old, my really, my 50-year-old. It's in a pot right now because I was moving it from the other house, and um, I can feel on it, and she's still got some pliable uh, limbs. So they're going to, they're probably going to come on out because she will, she's going to come out on her old wood on that one. So the um, dead wood, though, I want to take out because the dead wood is just a place for insects and so forth to get in there. And so you want to be to get rid of that. And when you prune the dead wood out, you prune it right down to the ground. Take it out completely all the way down to the ground. This is the City Line series. That this particular slide is actually a place. But uh, it, this is the dwarf version of them. And see how little they are? <clears throat> they have much smaller blooms and everything. So if you are looking for a hydrangea plant that you want to set in small containers or on your patio or things like that, the table, it's a good table arrangement, then you want to look for the seed line series. And I don't know who in this area may carry it. Just call some of our nurseries and see who might have it. The diseases for uh, hydrangeas, uh, there's not too awful many. 
actually. They, um, one up there in the corner is that gray leaf mold. That one is um, usually only found in nurseries that is caused from uh, too much moisture and it causes, sets up a fungus. And that happens a lot in, in the nursery. So therefore, it's not as likely for you to have it um, on that one. Powdery mildew. Okay, the, the best thing for powdery mildew is air. If you have planted your hydrangeas too close, and when you plant, you know, you need to plant them three, three to 10 foot apart. And that seems like, oh my goodness, I've got this little bush and I've just planted it and I've got this whole big area. So in the meantime, until the bush gets larger, set some pots around in there, set some other, put some annuals or something in there. But once it reaches its size, it really does not need to touch its neighbor. It needs to live in a little community, but it does not need to be crowded because the air needs to circulate around it. And that's what causes it. If we get a, a real rainy spring, then that's the powdery mildew. And that's for all the plants that get that particular um, disease. If you just be sure that they've got plenty of air around them, because high humidity and a lot of rain is what causes this to happen. This um, ring spore um, virus over here is not very common. It, it's, it's more uncommon. You don't see it. It's just like white spots on the leaf. And it's a very serious one. It will actually kill the plant on that one. And, um, but we don't you hardly ever see that around here. I've, I've, I've never had it. The one that you see the most of is the leaf spots. And they're little brown spots. It's caused by bacteria. Um, they can come from a number of sources. And for the most part, it never hurts the plant. It makes it very ugly and it very unsightly. And my old fashioned one, my really old uh, antique one, I call it, on that one, uh, she gets it every year and it doesn't make any difference what I do. She's gonna get that brown spot every single year. And uh, I've got one or two others that get it. And I've got some that have never had it whatsoever. They've never touched it at all. So it does, it won't kill the plant. Sometimes people say it's caused from overhead watering. Uh, I've gone through the, a period of time where I did not, I very carefully didn't overhead water at all, thinking maybe it was the chemicals in the water system or something like that. It didn't make a difference. It's just something that happens in nature and um, it just some varieties seem to have it more than others. For our pest, there is a moth that is called the leaf tear moth. It's a pretty moth actually, but this is what it does to the plant. It, um, it just it curls up the leaves similar to what happens to your cannas. It just curls it all up. If you get that on them, then you want to take that entire limb, leaf and everything off and you want to destroy it. Do not put it in your compost. Don't do that. Just destroy it completely on that one. But don't even open it up. Just keep it closed up like that. Just take the whole thing off, kind of like those bag worms that we get on the trees and so forth. You know, that it does, it rolls up the leaf and it's inside there. It's full of little caterpillars. And if they ever hatch out and get onto the onto the plant, they just they just have a good heyday. They just love to start eating. So if you see this, that's what you've got. Take it off and get rid of it. Now then. If you got little tiny holes in your leaves, this is probably caused by the lycus bug. This thing is so tiny. It is, this is a blow up. It's only one quarter of an inch is all this little bug is. And so it's very hard to see it. You'll have to take a magnifying glass and really look to see if you can find it. And if you've got it, then you might want to give it, you know, hit it with a little bit of 7-7. Um, uh, something like the seven dust or something like that, just to temporarily kind of take care of the situation. Look under the leaf more than likely. Uh, that's where it is, however it can be on the top on that one. But it's just such a tiny little thing. The only reason you'll know is you'll have holes. Now that doesn't mean that if you've got the holes, you do have it because nature itself, there's other little insects that come along and they take bites out of everything. That happens. So it doesn't mean you've got it, but if you seem to have more than you think was normal, then start looking for this lycus bug. The uh, things for oak leaf hydrangea that can cause a problem for them, uh, there is a bacterial disease that it can get. And if I can find my notes here. It's called, and I'll never say it, it's bullyrosis. It's um, 
And what happens is that several days of cloudy and humid, rainy weather, we'll call it, to turn, the leaves will do a leaf drop. They'll turn brown and they'll do a leaf drop. And then that's it. That's not anything that you can really control because it's the atmosphere that causes it to happen. And then there's another one uh, that's got a big long name, but anyway, what it means is root rot. And um, that one will take it out in 24 hours. And a good example of that is that um, I had an oak leaf hydrangea and I had bought it in like May. And I decided as I do with most of my bushes, I prefer to plant them in the fall. So I was saving it to the fall. Well, then uh, the fall came, that particular fall came, and that year I was out getting the last things of the yard, I fell and broke my leg. So that one did not get planted and it stayed in the pot all winter long. Well, that was okay. But the next spring it came out and then it got, to, and I thought, well, okay, I'll just let it stay in the pot and I'll wait till fall again. Well, then that summer it started to get very warm and it started drooping. So I watered it and it perked up and that was fine. But then the next few days, it looked droopy again. So I decided, okay, I'll put a dish under it and I'll water it that way it won't run through. And then it just got worse and worse. And what I did was I killed it with loving kindness. I watered it too much and the roots were standing in water and it killed it completely. Even though it survived the winter in a pot, it lost itself to being in, the, in too much water. And cause oak leaves want it, like we said before, much drier conditions. So that is a root rot that will take out the oak leaf. Propagation. Now, any, anytime we've got something that we, we love, we want to get more of it. And of course, our budget would like us to do that well, too. There are two methods, pretty much, for uh, hydrangeas. One is the leaf cuttings. Um, that one is where you take the, uh, the cutting and you put it in the water, or you can put it in, um, root, in root tone and then put it in a, a seed starting medium with, with the maniculite and all this stuff that goes in it to make that medium and you can do it that way. I haven't had as much luck with the cutting. Um, I do know that uh, a lady told me that one of the secrets to the cutting is that when you break it off of the bush, it needs to have a little pop, you know, kind of like celery or iceberg lettuce has this kind of a crunch to it. Well, when you take it off, if it has this kind of a little pop, then it's ready to be that. And that may be my problem because I've just taken them off and tried to start them and it didn't work. So I'm going to try to use that idea of when I pull it off, it has a little crunch to it and see if I can do the leaf cuttings that way. The way that I prefer, the way that I've been doing the most is the layering method. And that is the one that I, I really like to use as much as I can on that one. The, um, and that's where you take and you take a branch, the low branch next to the, next to the, the soil there. And you can go ahead and you can uh, cut a little bit of the, shave a little bit of the bark off and put some root tone on it if you like. Lay it over on the ground, then put something on it that will weigh it down so it'll stay there. Cover all of it up with, with leaf mulch or wherever it is and just forget about it. Just leave it there. It's still attached to the mother plant and therefore it will still get its nutrients and everything while it's trying to develop roots. Now then, it is important though that it be on the ground uh, nature does this itself, so this is why layering works so good, because I've had some of mine just to go ahead and, and, and do their own, have their own little babies by laying their branches over and propagating that way. But it is important that it's touching the ground. Now, a few years ago, I was teaching this particular class, and I had lost my Marissa, which is the one I showed you earlier, which was the oak, which was the variegated leaf one. And uh, I had mentioned it. Well, the lady happened to have one. And uh, so she was, she just went home and she's a wonderful person. She decided to surprise me. And so she layered one over on the top of a pot. And come springtime, she called me and she said, I've got you, a, I've got your plant for you. And so I drove almost, it's almost an hour from my house to where she lives. And I drove up there uh, to get it. And uh, as soon as I, we walked around the garden, she had a gorgeous garden. We walked around. Uh, and she showed me what, the, what it was. She reached over and she cut it away from the mother plant. Now it did have some roots, but the problem was she laid it on top of a pot. And while it had a, a few roots on it, it was still getting all of its nourishment, everything still from the mother plant because a pot was above ground. And therefore it was exposed to all the cold and the hot and the, everything that went on in the winter. And it did not have the same growing ability as the ground. 
it needs to be on the ground. I took it home and I did everything that I could to try to keep it alive, but it just it was, has, had not established itself well enough. Maybe if it stayed another season and there, maybe it would have made it, I don't know. Except that it's just nature layers it on the ground. So um, if you wanna try a pot, maybe bury the pot in the ground and then lay it over on that. So then later when you dig it up, maybe it will have put its roots down in the pot area and that might work, I have, haven't tried that, but it might be a, an alternative to have it already in the pot. But the layering is, is by far uh, the easiest way to go. And actually that works with so many of your bushes. I've just done that with a uh, lower pedlum and I've done that with, uh, with a gardenia. And I've got two little baby plants right now that's ready to, to come off of those plants. So uh, layering is, is, is nature's way, so it's, it's one of the more successful ways to propagate. Now, oak leaf hydrangeas, they actually have seeds. They're in those florets and so forth. So when it dries out, get you a, a paper, brown paper bag or something, and shake it down in there, and you will actually get seeds off of your oak leaf hydrangeas. They actually do have the seeds. Layering works with them as well, but uh, they do have seeds as opposed to the other hydrangeas that do not have seeds. Hydrangeas are beautiful in containers if the cane dangers are large enough. They will have to be very large on there because they, they are a bush and, there's, and they want to be a bush, except for the new little city line and, and it can be in a smaller container, but that's what they are. And they're beautiful in, in, in that area, since as you can see in these pictures. This is a picture of the uh, wildlife, uh, the uh, wild, not wildlife, but wild hydrangea that grows all over, as you can see, from clear up to, to the New York area and everything, all the way down over to, um, that's probably like Arkansas, on down into Louisiana at this point. It doesn't go on down into Florida, because this is zone four. Remember, hydrangeas don't go to zone four and below. So this up here is, um, is, is where they will grow. And this is where Annabelle was a cultivar from. And remember, Annabelle always blooms. And I'll tell you how hardy Annabelle is, and the fact that I got Annabelle in, in uh, May of uh, 2013, I believe, no, 2000, and, yes, 2000, no, 2012. And um, uh, again, I wanted to wait till the, till the fall. And, uh, but for, uh, and so that summer we had plenty of rain, everything was just fine and she did well, but that was the summer that the, our group, Master Gardeners, which I told you was the best in the state, we won third place internationally for our fair exhibit, and it was a cruise to Alaska, so many of us went on that. Well, the only time it did not rain all summer long was while we were gone, so 10 days without any rain, I came back, and Annabelle looked like she was gone completely, and she didn't seem to revive at all, so I figured I'd lost her, but for some reason, I didn't take her out of the pot for the winter. I just left it. Come springtime, there she was. She was sticking her little heads up and she was starting to bloom on that, on the old wood that was, that was already there. And so Annabelle is one of the hardiest ones that you can get. And um, there is another one out now that's, that's probably gonna be something like it. And this is called Incredible. And the blooms are getting up to 10 and 12 inches across. That's why they're calling it Incredible. So uh, that one's another one that they expect to be uh, good and hardy for that one. Hydrangeas can grow just about any place in your landscape. Again, morning sun, afternoon shade, for the most part, uh, a lot more sun for the oak leaves uh, and even longer, longer periods of sun for them and a drier area. The, all the others, lace cap, mop heads and so forth, they need to be where the soil stays moist, not moist. And uh, they definitely need the afternoon uh, shade. They do not need afternoon sun, so they need to be morning sun. So walk around your your uh, landscape and see where they would best be. They're good next to fences. They're out plant just out in in the middle. They're on rock walls. Great path down a pathway uh, to to see these because, like I say, some of them can get very very tall, and they're just it's just gorgeous to to walk through there. They're the happiest happiest bush you can put in your plant in your landscape on that one, and it's very rewarding to have plenty of the um, hydrangeas. And so at the end of the day, there we are, and it's sunset and a hillside full of beautiful hydrangeas. And that's the presentation for today. Any questions will be fine. Okay, let's start with the questions. Um, let's go from 
Yeah, uh, the first one is I did some layering last fall, but most don't seem to have roots yet. How long does it take to root? It usually takes a full season. Uh, we had an extremely rainy winter, and so our, our growing conditions were not good as, as normally be. I heard on the news the other day, we normally get four to five inches of rain. We got 18 inches of rain this winter. So I would just leave it alone uh, again through the summer and check it again in the fall. Just keep a watch on it all summer. But we our growing conditions and propagating conditions with that much rain this year uh, is, is not been good. So I, I would just leave it attached to the mother plant till you see a good root system. Next question, it says, do you have a favorite nursery that carries a wide variety of hydrangeas? Uh, actually, there's the, around, the ones around here carry some of the more common ones. There is a, a new nursery. I haven't been there yet. I want to go. Uh, it's down uh, close to a, a, a right below Atlanta. I, I haven't got the name in front of me. But they have, I think they have something like, I don't know, 20 or 30 different varieties or, or even more. They, that hydrangeas is their really thing. You can Google it, uh, a nursery, a Georgia a nursery. Uh, would get there. The, the ones we have around here, uh, they will have the lace cap, they will have the, the endless summer ones because that's been around for a little while. They'll have the more common ones that are more successful. Some of the newer varieties, maybe I would say uh, Bar Nursery seems to get more of the newer varieties earlier than some of the others. I'm not familiar with um, the um, the mountain, I can't think of the mountain, Signal Mountain Nursery, that big ride. I'll tell you another place that you can go to that it's not a nursery, but it's Ace Hardware on, on 58. And that, that they have one of the best uh, garden centers of anybody around here with the greatest variety. And of course we, we love them because they also uh, uh, help support us a great deal as master gardeners. Uh, we normally in May have Q and A tables there uh, for that one, but uh, check them out because they have a wide variety of things. And if they don't have something you're looking for, uh, you ask them, and they're very good about ordering it. Okay, hey, um, how long does it take for a climbing hydrangea to grow up a tree? Uh, probably two to three years before you start to really see it doing its thing. Uh, it'll stay alive down there. Uh, like I say, I had to put its tentacles and so forth up there. I kind of put them on the tree and put a rope around it. And this is uh, this would be my third year for that particular one, and I've noticed that it has, has attached itself to the tree and is starting to climb. So just give it some give it some time. Uh, and the problem with the tree is, of course, it depends on on our. It's got to be a good supported tree. It's got to be an older tree. And some of our trees, though, you know, the roots are the big heavy roots are there. So you've got to find a place that you can plant. And sometimes it's out away from the tree, and it has to kind of grow to the tree. So when it starts to send out those long branches, just kind of encourage it to go to the tree. But once it attaches to the tree, it, it takes off then and, and starts to go. Next question is, what kind of light does Ruby Slippers like? Ruby Slippers will be one that will take a little bit more sun because she's in the Oakley family. So she's going to take a little bit more sun than, than the other. It's, it's, a, it's in the Oakley family, needs the drier soil. And, and more sun. And that's when I bought my vanilla, strawberry vanilla, the nursery, met, and it was down here in, in most host of Dalton. And once his daddy got ready to retire, they'd been in the nursery business for a lot of years and they, they retired and sold the nursery. But when I bought it there, he told me, he said, this one likes the sun. And so he reminded me that it needed to be more sun. How large will PG hydrangeas, how, how large will the tree girl, PG tree girl? Uh, the, the regular PG tree, uh, you, you won't, it won't get very tall because you're going to need to kind of prune it back to keep it into that tree shape. So you're probably looking at something that's not more than five at the most, I would think, if that much. Four to five, probably. Would a climber work on river birch? That one I'm not sure because that's the tree that sheds its bark and everything. So I couldn't tell you for sure about that one because it does have to set its little uh, aerial roots has to get into that bark and it sheds its bark. So I'm I'm not sure. The ones that I've seen are on oak and and the nut trees and and things like that. That's got the uh, bark it can sink into. Did you say Annabelle's? 
could handle wet roots a little bit better? Uh, Annabelle can take a morsel, but not, not wet, no. In fact, none of them are gonna take wet, wet. So they're, they're, not in, they're not in your bog garden. They're not gonna be in your rain garden. Uh, they need moist, but they do not need wet, wet uh, on that one. And so, uh, but Annabelle, Annabelle is very adaptable to uh, drier soil and she would survive, uh, you know, a temporary puddle or that type of thing. It's not like oak leaf that if it stood in water very long, it would go. She won't do that, but um, she uh, doesn't need to be in wet, wet soil. Someone asked, were you referring to Wilkerson Mill Gardens in Georgia? Yes, I am. That's okay. the name. So someone wrote that in there if they want. <laughs> yeah, yeah, that one we might want to be. Maybe we'll take a field trip, go down there. <laughs> would climbing hydrangeas attach to the wood of a screened in porch? They will attach to the cedar and the cedar wood type of thing, not your smooth painted wood necessarily, but, the, but like something like cedar or this type of thing, it will do that. It will go to brick, it will go to rock, uh, anything that's porous. But now if it's the smooth wood that's been painted a lot and it you know, doesn't have any, any porous things to it, then you might have to consider, it might not do as well. And of course the paint, of course, is not necessarily good either, but cedar, because I have cedar on my, on, my, on my house. Cedar, it will do with cedar. Okay, how often or, or do you water your oak leaf hydrangeas? I just water it uh, if it looks like it needs water. Uh, last summer when we had the drought as such, uh, I did water it. I did not uh, because, I mean, everything was dry. So, you know, I did water the oak leaf as well. They, uh, it was doing fine. It was starting to look, uh, it looked just a little, little droopy on that one. And so I gave it uh, just a little bit of water, which of course the ground just soaked it up like everything on that one. But uh, I watered the other plants more than I watered that one. But uh, I did give it some water then because it was just, it, it was everything was so dry. Okay, I think that that takes care of the questions. I wanna thank Carol. I'm gonna stop the recording here.